thank you and thank you in advance our panelists, uh, our President Walter Isaacson will join us in a minute. Uh, I just have the pleasure of welcoming everybody to the room and saying a little bit about our own work at the Initiative on Financial Security. Aspen does a lot of things, but let me say what we do. The Initiative on Financial Security works on bold solutions to increase financial security in America. We work on everything from child accounts to retirement accounts that are both simple and secure. And we believe that the best policy comes after a process of strong debate and working with industry and with consumer advocates. So today's debate is right up our alley. We are really looking forward to that because financial reform is truly fundamental for Americans' financial security. Today's financial reform efforts will surely have a lasting impact on the structure of our banking system. And yet, they will also have a dramatic impact on Americans in their everyday financial lives, whether that means preventing future taxpayer bailouts or securing access to fair and transparent financial services. Reform of the financial services uh, system will touch us all. And so it's with that understanding that we brought together Mr. Edward Yingling and Mr. Damon Silvers. I'll now go, that'll be the end of the misters. <laughs> I think you'll go to Ed and Damon to engage on the many issues of the day. And we really hope for both a lively and engaging debate, one that explores really the complexity in, of the issues and how they affect Americans across the country. I'm going to start introducing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Walter, who's just joined us. So first, uh, Ed Yingling. Ed is the president and CEO of the American Bankers Association. Ed's a 20-year veteran at the American Bankers Association and has headed up the government relations department and was most recently the ABA's executive vice president. So Ed, we're thankful to have you here. Damon uh, is the Director of Policy and Special Counsel to the AFL-CIO. And in addition, uh, Damon Silvers is the Deputy Chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel for TARP and served as Chair of the Competition Subcommittee of the U.S. Treasury Department. You have more bio information on your chairs. And finally, I, I really want to thank both of you for coming and uh, putting <laughs> Aside the blackberries, all of us, it's hard for, for uh, the next 90 minutes. And I want to thank uh, my president, Walter Isaacson, uh, for doing this for us again. Uh, really one of the country's most outstanding moderators who knows how to play jazz, not just uh, go through a debate like this. And we're really looking forward to these issues. So thank you, Walter. And well, thank you, Lisa. You're the one who pulled this together. And it's a really important topic, especially with Senator Dodd. Uh, launching things. I don't know if this is a high compliment to say you're one of the country's great moderators. <laughs> <laughs> Me, Jeff Greenfield, it's like it's a minor task in this world to be able to sit there and uh, ask people questions. But this is a particularly important one, uh, this debate. And I don't know when you scheduled it, but your timing is impeccable <laughs> given what's happening uh, this week. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, when the financial markets began to show their stress, uh, you know, the headlines focused a bit on the housing market and the subprime defaults. And um, most journalists and I think a lot of officials uh, were confident that any loose threads in the economy wouldn't come totally unraveled uh, by the housing market uh, situation. And yet, uh, we ended up being on the precipice of what could have been the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. In fact, everybody said we were in the worst financial <laughs> crisis since the Great Depression. My wife, we were out in Aspen. I remember Amy was there uh, for the Forsman Little Conference. And uh, she was wandering around taking money out of our Citibank account and buying CDs at various local Colorado <laughs> banks. And I said, well, that's wacky. The whole financial system is not going to collapse. She says, it's not wacky. I saw Andrea Mitchell, and she said she had done the same thing. <laughs> so we have the mea culpa of the maestro Chairman Greenspan on the record, both from this podium and many other places. But the fact that his wife thought the entire financial system was about to go under shows how bad things were uh, 12 months ago. I'm not sure, and maybe this will be a subtopic of our debate, whether the administration has gotten enough credit or whether they were just lucky uh, by the fact that we haven't gone off of a cliff. 
uh, that uh, somehow or another our Citibank account seems okay, that even when I drive around the South, uh, the foreclosures that I thought were going to totally unravel communities uh, in Louisiana and Alabama and Mississippi uh, seem to be somewhat under control. And somehow or another, we didn't quite have the Great Depression, although obviously we're in a pretty bad situation both with unemployment and with the sense of uh, can we trust our financial institutions, uh, which leads us to the topic, which is rebuilding and strengthening the regulatory framework. Um, and I guess we would agree, although there's going to be a lot of disagreement, that we probably need some reform of uh, financial uh, regulatory system, but I don't know if there's much agreement uh, on what form that uh, reform should take, and it's kind of hard to barrel, whether it's health care or financial reform, uh, down a major change into a reform, into a regulatory structure, unless there's some consensus of exactly what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. So I do think it'd be useful to get people working together, uh, both on the Dodd bill and many other things, and I think this is the beginning of that with a little, uh, not the beginning, but one small step in that process with two such distinguished people here. And I wanted to thank you all for participating in this uh, debate. And Ed, maybe I'd just start with you. Let's start from the very beginning. What financial reform do you think is needed? Well, Walter, first, thank you for, uh, for inviting me to be here today with, with uh, Damon. Um, we actually, I actually testified uh, over a year ago in October uh, before the Congress before the administration, and we uh, testified in favor of reform, and many of the elements of that reform are actually in the, the administration's proposal, not because we uh, put them forth, they weren't taking the ABA proposals, but I think it is an area where if you look at the core, there actually is a lot of agreement on the core principles. I'm interested to see what Damon says, but it, on some of the core principles. Um, at some point here, maybe we'll go back and talk about what caused this crisis, what took what should have been a, a housing-related recession, maybe a maybe a, a serious recession, but turned it into a panic. And Actually, why don't we start there? I mean, I, I know I, I leapt ahead a bit, okay. but it'd be nice to know what well, got, us, got us into this? Well, Why did um, I have the answer to that on a card, and I uh -oh. didn't have the other answer. Well, we hand it out, uh, but it's uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I car I carry this card around because uh, there. I think it, again, I'll be interested in seeing what Damon says, but there's a lot of consensus on what caused the the crisis in housing, but it tur also turned it into a panic, and I think it's very important to understand what happened because there are also kind of miss, I'll call them, about some of the causes. They're not directly related. Uh, you don't need the little ball, don't worry. Uh, just you broke your toy already. Hey, uh, already, Tariq, yeah. will you come uh, help up there? Thanks. Go ahead, Tariq. The, uh, uh, the, it's important to really understand what did cause it. There are a few things floating around now, and, you, and I frankly scratch my head and say, why are those on the table? Because they really had nothing to do with it, or they're not factually mm -hmm. correct. But just I'll just read the top 12 reasons. Uh, in no particular order, but starting with uh, macro, if you will. There was excess liquidity floating around worldwide. I think Greenspan, you teed him up, gets a lot of, uh, of uh, the negative publicity about that. Having been in meetings with central bankers every year, uh, we're involved in a meeting every year, for years in advance of this, they talked about the fact, and this would be Trichet from Europe and Greenspan and others, that they were having trouble because they really couldn't control this excess liquidity worldwide. And I think one of the questions that isn't talked about is how you have countries with their individual monetary policy, but they cannot seem to affect the fact that there is so much liquidity worldwide. Uh, no one was looking over the whole economy. We did not have what we would call a systemic risk regulator. Somebody would say, well, that was the Fed's role, but if you read their statutes and stuff, that was not their mandate. Uh, excess leverage on Wall Street at firms with 30 to 1 leverage and beyond. Actually, traditional banks, we call them, uh, were very well, in the U.S., were very well capitalized going to, into this. That's not to say there aren't capital issues involved, 
but our banks were very well capitalized. One of the interesting things is European banks were one half to one third as well capitalized mm -hmm. as the U.S., and that's where some of the contagion really got going. Problems with Fannie or, and Freddie, which in the Fed's defense they labeled. We, we had argued for more regulation of Fannie and Freddie for many mm -hmm. years. Um, and misguided compensation policies where, frankly, people were incented to do the wrong thing, particularly mortgage brokers, but also on Wall Street. Now, I put them all together because one of the big questions I think that's hard to understand is how did this junk that was produced, no down payment, no doc loans, loans that reset and couldn't be repaid by the person with their own uh, finances, how did they get sold? Well, the reasons I just outlined created a system where people were buying this junk. Mm -hmm. Then going on quickly, that, and on the housing side, you had lack of consumer protection, lack of consumer education would be part of it, but mostly lack of consumer protection. Um, you had structured investment vehicles that may go on the other side of this line, but you had what are called sieves, which <coughs> this really is what nailed City and Merrill Lynch. They thought these things, and they did think these things were off balance sheet, and legally they were. The problem was when the storm hit, they ended up back on their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Two that are a little more controversial, mark-to-market accounting, which poured gasoline on the fire, uh, out-of-control short selling. They needed to put the uptick rule back in. They didn't. Uh, problems with credit default swaps, and then one we'll talk about, I'm sure, maybe the most important part of this, what, what really helped turn this into a panic, was the lack of a method to resolve what we now call too big to fail institutions in an orderly fashion. Mm -hmm. So that would be my top 12 But reasons. real quickly, before I see if that, how uh, Damon's list, what is not on your list? In other words, what do people think caused this crisis that you think is a wrong cause? Glass-Steagall. Right. Steagall has nothing whatsoever to do Even with though this. Mr. Volcker now wants to well, almost you got, recreate glass Well, you have to, I mean, people use Glass-Steagall as a shorthand, but when he, if he is talking about proprietary trading, that's not Glass-Steagall. Mm -hmm. And I can, I'll, I'll go through this, I don't want to do it all now if you want to, but there is no causal connection between the, between the repeal of Glass-Steagall and this. All issue. right, let's go into Damon first. Uh, you don't have to do 12, because you have, okay. uh, that's a little much, but... Uh, do a, uh, a list of what caused it and you're then the, what didn't cause you're it. You're the expert, so you probably yeah. have 30 now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we could take a lot of time on this, but um, let me just say that I think that to one degree or another, I don't have a problem with any of the items that Ed just listed uh, as, having to do, have, as being related to the, the cause of the crisis. And, but I think that what you got was a list of like kind of disconnected facts. Mm -hmm. I think we, you need a, to, to understand what happened, you need a narrative. And the narrative takes all these things and weaves them together, these, fa these disconnected point. facts. And, and at the end of my narrative, I'm going to tell you why Glass-Steagall mattered. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, let's start with where Ed started, which was excess liquidity. Right? The excess liquidity, uh, which means there's a lot of money sloshing around in the world economy looking to lend, looking to be lent to someone. This is, the, this is a byproduct of a long-term strategy, strategy in the United States uh, to have a financialized economy where we consume but do not make. And as a result, we run large trade deficits with our foreign trading partners. Our foreign trading partners pile up dollars, and what do they do with them? I mean, they, they invest them. And a country like China, which is trying to grow, doesn't want to take a lot of risk, so they invest in credit markets. Lo and behold, there's lots of dollars sloshing around in credit markets. Uh, this was a point made at great length by Niall Ferguson uh, yesterday in the New York Times op-ed page. It's a critical, mm -hmm. critical underlying feature of, of what went wrong here. So we have to begin the narrative of what went wrong with the United States' strategy over a generation, right, to have an economy that was low wage and high consumption and ultimately to fund that economy with debt. That, those decisions drove and made it impossible to resist the deregulatory thrust of American financial policy over the last 10 years or so. And we all know the, 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 the marking points of that deregulatory march. The, you know, Graham, uh, Graham Leach Bliley, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, uh, the exemption of, uh, uh, of derivatives uh, from regulation in the Commodities Futures Modernization Act, uh, 
the transformation of Fanny and Freddie, to come to another one of Ed's points, the transformation of Fanny and Freddie from a more or less, more or less heavily regulated quasi-public entity into enterprises that, were, that had a, an implicit public guarantee, but were run to make giant amounts of money for the executives and the stockholders. Uh, a crazy arrangement of things, if you think about it for a moment. I think you all both would agree on that. Right. Agree on that. Yeah. Right. But what drove Fannie and Freddie there right, was the deregulation of the mortgage markets more broadly and the competition that came from the uh, essentially uh, private, uh, high, uh, high margin, high fee, high interest rate uh, mortgage lenders who increasingly were subprime. Now, here's where I think you know, our story diverges. Because the st what the story I'm telling is you have a fundamentally unsustainable economic strategy that then drives the deregulation of the, of the financial sector uh, and then lives off of a housing bubble that could not, could not sustain itself. When the housing bubble crashes, it turns out that everything is linked to everything else and that the regulators have no, uh, in the words of the Paulson folks that I talked with while this was happening, they had no line of sight into what was going on. It wasn't, that, it wasn't just that the capital requirements were too weak. It wasn't just that the governance structures were wrong. It was that literally when things went wrong, because, because we'd allowed a Swiss cheese regulatory system to develop, there was no line of sight into what the real nature of an, of an enterprise like Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers was. Now, the, these things, so, that, so you have these long-term structural causes, and then you have these short-term you know, immediate reasons why certain situations went terribly wrong. Why, why does Glass-Steagall matter? And then what are the four things we need to do to fix this? So we, doesn't, we don't do this again. Because right? I, gave you, I, gave I gave you a brief narrative that tries to tie together some of the themes mm -hmm. Ed did. If, I, if, if we wanted to run the clock here, I could weave them all. No, let's get to your right. four. <laughs> why does Glass-Steagall matter? What Glass-Steagall said was you don't, do bank, you don't do commercial banking with insured deposits at the same time as you do securities underwriting, proprietary trading, and fast forward to the contemporary financial world, derivatives. That's not true, by the way, but go ahead. Well, no, I mean, the, 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 the deriv I'm not saying that when Glass-Steagall was written, it contemplated derivatives. I'm saying that if you apply those principles, you would, you would, you would take financial derivatives. You would put the wall right. and put derivatives on that right. side. Okay. I'm not... Derivatives weren't around when Glass-Steagall was written in the way that they are now. The way in which the banking system got tied into the, the subprime world, and there's a lot of mumbo-jumbo about this, right? Bankers will say, well, we didn't have anything to do with that. That was somebody else. The way they were involved was, A, the banks financed the subprime lenders. They might have been some storefront operation you've never heard of, but they got their cash from somebody like Citigroup or Wells Fargo or Bank of America. 21 out of 25 major subprime lenders owned or financed by a major bank. So that's one. Two, the process that Ed described, the securitization, run by securities affiliates of large banks, would not have been possible had Glass-Steagall existed. And three, Glass-Steagall in its original form, it got weakened in, it got yeah. weakened in steps. And three, the temptation always present to be involved in high risk, high return financial activities with government guarantees explicit or implicit behind them. High risk, high return financial activities, derivatives, the, uh, the uh, thrift of the, the, the actual AIG entity doing derivatives was a thrift, right, in the banking system. Mm -hmm. Proprietary trading. That's what Paul Volcker is really worried about now, that banks are trying to rebuild their capital structures using proprietary trading. Uh, and, and derivatives themselves, financial derivatives themselves. Uh, the, there are five dominant players in that market. Th uh, they, are, they are all bank holding companies. All right, let me now, four, four, yeah. f how do we fix it? Four things. Re-regulate the mortgage markets, strengthen consumer protections in the mortgage markets, rebuild the civil rights protections in the mortgage markets. One. Two. Separate bank. I'm separate, sorry. Uh, explain to me what rebuild civil rights protections means. We have Briefly. something. We have something called the Community Reinvestment Act. Right. It basically re has required that mortgage lenders be fair and open to communities of color and uh, communities that have been deprived of mortgage credit. It doesn't. It only applies. It, its enforcement mechanism is the merger of commercial banks. 
in the in the deregulated mortgage right. markets, you're not allowed rent. to merge unless you can prove you've right. done the CRA. In the Got deregulated it. mortgage markets we have today, right. this doesn't capture in, in any respect okay. the, the full range of things. Yeah. Sure. All right, yeah. mortgage markets one, two. Separate the regulation of banks with an eye toward their safety and soundness, i.e., their business success, from the regul from the protection of consumers in the financial markets. Mm -hmm. This is President Obama's number one priority in financial mm -hmm. reform. It's absolutely right. And it's a major reason why everything went wrong that we asked people like the Federal Reserve, whose first job was safety and soundness, to look out for consumers. In the end, we neither got safety and soundness, nor did we get consumer protection. Mm -hmm. Third, re-regulate the shadow markets, derivatives, hedge funds, private equity, off-balance sheet vehicles, the whole, that whole range of things that are actually very much old wine and new bottles. And fourth, uh, and here Ed and I probably agree to a point, uh, that we need an effective fully public systemic risk regulator uh, so, that, uh, mm -hmm. we, so that we don't and, and so that we don't end up in the kind of situation that we've ended up in the last year where we have quote too big to fail banks that are not re toughly regulated at the, at the front end and where we have no, no uh, established procedures for dealing with what happens when they fail on the back end. Let, let me get Ed because there's so many things you put on the table right. and do them one at a time. One is that the securitization of mortgages would not have happened had Glass-Steagall stayed in place and that was one of the causes of the problem. Well, we'll have a little, I guess we'll have a little debate here, but I don't want you to get stuck on Glass-Steagall. Um, Glass-Steagall has almost nothing to do with derivatives, almost nothing to do with proprietary trading. They were all done in banks. Banks have done foreign exchange trading forever. And so Glass-Steagall, I think, is used to, to raise issues that really are not Glass-Steagall. Let's go over the major firms that failed that led to the problem. Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns, a freestanding investment bank. Fannie and Freddie, obviously nothing to do with Glass-Steagall. Lehman Brothers, a freestanding investment bank. Merrill Lynch, now they, do, they did have little banks in them, but they, and actually those banks they could have prior to the repeal of Glass-Steagall, they were called non-bank banks. Mm -hmm. um, and AIG, an insurance company, and I'm sorry, but I don't think their derivatives were done through their savings and loan, they were done in England. Uh, but anyway, that, I, I, that, let's not get, yeah. I don't want to get too diverted it's on that. Right. But, and let me ask you, instead but, of going but, back to Glass-Steagall, look ahead, how would you split banks or would you split banks so they wouldn't be too big to fail and we could separate the risky uh, um, activities from consumer protected activities? Well, I guess I, this, it was kind of a question that was asked Ben Bernanke yesterday, and he answered it better than I can. Uh, I'll give my version of it, but you could go look at the tape yesterday and get a better answer to it. I don't think you go and you say, okay, we are making determinations that we're going to split J.P. Morgan Chase in a third. Uh, what there seems to be a consensus about and what there will be, not in every detail, what there will be in these bills is the ability for the systemic regulator, uh, say it's the Fed, to go into large institution X and say proprietary trading. I'm looking at your proprietary trading and this part of it is so risky, I'm not going to let you do it. <clears throat> this part of it is more risky, I'm going to make you, you can, you can still do it because there's a business reason for doing it, an economic reason for doing it, but I'm going to make you wall it off and I'm going to make you have extra capital against that. Uh, I'm going to look very hard at your liquidity in, in this and to make sure that if something goes wrong, you can fund it, which, it, which a lot of what happened in the crisis was not actually people going insolvent. It was they couldn't they couldn't fund themselves because they didn't have the liquidity. A Bear Stearns, a Lehman Brothers, a, a Wachovia, these were liquidity problems. So I'm going to look very hard at your liquidity and make sure you can mm -hmm. actually fund yourself if things go wrong. In that sense, I think what Bernanke was saying yesterday is you will have anchors on larger institutions. I, I do think if I were the CEO of a really large institution looking at what is very likely to be enacted, uh, the core parts of it, I would be very concerned about my business model. And by anchor you mean liquidity, liquidity uh, needs? capital, uh, increased costs, they're going to pay uh, okay. uh, uh, probably one way or another, they're going to pay premiums into a too big to fail fund. 
they're going to have higher insurance premiums. Uh, so I think uh, that what will happen is you will see anchors around the larger institutions. If you look at an historical perspective, people always take a snapshot and say, well, my God, look how big these institutions are. If you do it domestically or worldwide and you have a time frame on it, it is a dynamic. And so that there will be competition, there will be changes involved. But uh, I think what is going to happen, and again, this is what Bernanke said, is you don't just say crudely cut in a third or something like that. You identify issues, and those issues will cause much And Marvin King in England is doing it in a more crude way in your vernacular. He's doing it in a more crude way. Again, I think that's been a little misreported, not necessarily what he said, but what England said, what Eng Great Britain is doing. Their institutions, one, are totally owned by the government in some instances. And so some of those decisions where they're saying divest or they're saying are business decisions, you shouldn't, from a business point of view, you shouldn't be in all these issues, mm -hmm. all these areas. And I think that will happen with some of our banks. Also, what they are doing, if you look, if you look at consolidate our, our concentration in Great Britain, it's twice what it is in the U.S. The top three firms basically have like 65% of the market, and they're yeah. saying, from, even from an antitrust view, that would not be able to happen. Let me let country. Damon jump in there. Well, it's, Ed ended at a great point, because I think you want to look at these issues of systemic risk regulation and the pronouncements uh, of the Fed, the bankers. Um, through, you've got to look at them through the lens of what's happened to the structure of our banking system. The United States used to be a country where we had some big banks, but where predominantly we had a, a, a decentralized system of small banks, predominantly. That's the, that's the country that I grew up in, but that is not the country we live in today. There are four banks that matter in this country, and they, are, and they have about 60% uh, of the assets uh, in the banking system. And they are, in order of their solvency, as far as I can tell, Citigroup, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and J.P. Morgan Chase. They, to all intents and purposes, and then, and then there's the special case of Goldman Sachs and, JP, and uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, which are bank holding companies now. And you imagine that's something that we would not have had absent the disappearance of Glass-Steagall. Uh, the, the, these, these are the dominant institutions. And uh, three out of four of them, three out of four of the banks I just listed, uh, have not been allowed to return their TARP money. They are too weak to return their TARP money. The question of who failed here, who the public had to pay for, mm -hmm. can't be understood unless you understand that these four multi-trillion dollar institutions, three out of four of them, in some respect, are living on public money right now. The fact that we chose not to rescue some of the institutions Ed mentioned that were not large commercial banks doesn't change the real nature of where, sort of where the game is being played here. And the question around systemic risk is what approach are we going to take in future to a financial system that looks like this? And one approach is to make the world safe for banks that are too big to fail. Get a regulator like the Federal Reserve System whose governance is intertwined with the banks meaning that the, large, the banks get to pick who sits on the boards of the regional Fed banks, and the regional Fed banks have the regulatory capacity uh, that, does the, that does the regulation of bank holding companies, and if they're given the kind of systemic risk authority that Ed was talking about, they'll have that capacity too. So we basically ask the banks to regulate themselves, and then they get to decide, well, is this little piece of our business too dangerous or not? And then when they get it wrong, because of course the profitable parts are often the dangerous parts, when they get it wrong, the systemic risk authority will have the capacity to take your and my money and give it to them again. And that's one model. Right. Now, the other model... Whose model is that? I don't know. That's I thought that's the model you Well, there is a lot of board... Of, <laughs> there is a board of regulators model being floated out right. there. Now, the other Nobody model. is proposing that model. Yeah. Now, the, the, yeah. Well, actually, if you look at the fine... Well, wait, go ahead, David, to your second one, because right. I want Edward to right. then be able to say his. I mean, unfortunately, this question is in play in Congress right now. Which model we get? The other model is a model of, for a fully public regulator meaning a regulator that has no involvement of the institutions that we might use public money to bail out. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of ways of doing that. You could do that through, uh, through reforms to the Fed. You could do that through a new institution. 
you could do that through a committee of regulators or the hybrid of a new institution and, commu and committee that Senator Dodd has proposed. Okay. Uh, the, but the other model is a fully public regulator. And secondly, some real limitations on the extent to which that fully public regulator uh, can bail out pieces of the capital structure of banks where there is no public interest in bailing them out. There is no public interest and never has been in bailing out the stockholders of a bank or any other financial institution. And sadly, we've just been engaged in an exercise in doing that over the last 18 months that's fundamentally damaged the credibility of the United States government in the eyes of the American people. Right? We need to not do that again. Right? Now, let me just be clear here, because I didn't <coughs> say this at the beginning that these are my opinions <laughs> and not the opinions of the Congressional Oversight Panel as a body uh, <laughs> and the like. But those, those, are, the, those are the choices. And they, that is a profound choice for the future of the United States. And it's being fought in Congress Okay, now. so how would you do a systemic regulator? Would it be a public one like uh, Damon said? I don't think those are the only yeah. two choices. Well, yeah, how would you do it? Um, well, we're, I think we're mixing two uh, things here. One is you, well, actually, there are three things, and I think this is in all the bills in one form or another. First, you have a systemic oversight agency of some type or other. Uh, we choose not to call it a regulator because we don't think, and this is something we proposed way back in October, it's in the administration's proposal, it's in some form or another in all bills. That is an agency that looks and identifies problems. I, I use the analogy of it sits up on top of Mount Olympus and looks around and says, what is that fire over there that, that's the mortgage crisis or, or the mortgage bubble building? Or what is the fire over here that we're not properly regulating uh, credit default swamps? And it identifies them, but it doesn't go in and regulate institutions. Second part of this, and that's in some form or another in all the bills. Uh, the second part of it is who regulates the major institutions, and that is where the administration says it ought to be the Fed. To a large degree, Barney Frank says it ought to be the Fed. We say it ought to be the Fed. Chris Dodd says it ought to be a new single regulator that regulates everybody. And then the third part, which uh, uh, Damon was talking about mostly at the end and where we have a lot of agreement is, okay, it's the year 2020 and an AIG goes in trouble again. How do you deal with it, with, with that AIG? And that is the resolution mechanism, which in some ways may be the most important. And there I would say I agree with, the, with what I understood Damon to say as a general theory, is that uh, we, what we have said is that that ought to basically be a controlled bankruptcy. Now, some are arguing this morning, even in the House committee, that you ought to put them in bankruptcy. The problem is the bankruptcy structure just isn't capable of handling that where you have certain issues of counterparties and you might have you might start a but by control of bankruptcy you mean that all shareholders equity holders, are, shareholders, shareholders, are wiped out, are shareholders are wiped out okay. the, the Would you agree executives with that? are wiped out the, well it's not quite what you mm -hmm. said the board is either wiped out or reconstituted creditors it, it depends mm -hmm. what we say is they ought to in that case you ought to apply bankruptcy principles so if you're unsecured you're in real trouble if you're secured you got you got uh, uh, secured, but only under current rules of bankruptcy. But basically the idea is, uh, uh, Barney Frank jokingly called this a death panel, and that's what we think it ought to be. It, it ought to be, uh, it ought to be uh, nobody's really too big to fail, even though the institution may come out in some fashion. Uh, the stockholders are wiped out, the management's gone, it's really Damon, tough. I mean, we do agree on this. Mm -hmm. the, 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 this is a point of agreement. and. Uh, <laughs> But the question is, are we actually going to get it? Because the, one of the issues in play on the Hill is we are here today, as they are marking up this bill in the House Financial Services Committee, is will the door be closed uh, to doing another bailout a la Citigroup or a la Bank of America in which none of the things I just said actually happened, right? in, which, in which stockholders were made whole, in which bondholders were made whole, uh, in which at least according to the Congressional Oversight Panel reports, the you know, the, the public, you and I, put money in uh, on less than, uh, you know, fair terms commercially. Uh, the, the door to that type of thing needs to be closed. If it's left open the slightest crack, then uh, in the exigencies of the moment, uh, we, we, will, we will do it again. Uh, yeah, that's right. but, 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 the, but, the, but the fact that we agree on this means that 
you know, but you'd think, right, that if, uh, that if the uh, Americans for Financial Reform that I'm in part here representing, 200 uh, uh, organizations, including the labor movement and ARP and so forth, and the banking industry agree on this, that we could get it done. Uh, but, uh, you know, Washington's a mysterious place, and sometimes things don't just, happen. Just, just, you just you an example say. of how hard this is, completely out of this context. But maybe many of you in this room aren't even aware of it, because very few people are. One of the one of the the critical moments in this whole crisis, never mentioned, is that overnight the Treasury and the Fed basically said we're going to guarantee over three trillion dollars in money market mutual funds. You never hear about that. How did they do that? They did it with the Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. That doesn't fit, does it? No, it doesn't fit at all. But they did it anyway. So to your point, if there's any crack, then then. Uh, it, it, we won't have where you and I are trying to go. So it needs to be very clear to people this is how it's going to be handled. How would you protect the consumers then? Well, I think consumer protection is a, is a very important part of this, and we have differences on, on the structure that I'm sure we'll get into. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I would analyze it this way. If you look at, if you look at the, uh, what happened, and if you look at where the weaknesses were, the the correct, and this is correct, is that people have said legitimately there was a lack of focus in our current regulatory system. And the two prime examples that are used are HOPA, where the Fed could have and didn't. The Fed could have a number of years ago under a statute called HOPA uh, put more regulation on the mortgage process. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, what isn't often understand is one of the reasons the Fed didn't do that, it's not sufficient, they, they should have done it, is they could write that regulation and they could enforce it on my members, but they could not enforce it on the mortgage brokers at the state level, uh, which is a critical gap in everything. And the other is credit cards, where the, where the Fed did put out a regulation, that the, the Congress trumped it, but there wasn't, I mean, the gaps were like that, the Fed could have done what the Congress did. The Fed had the authority, they were slow in acting, they had the authority under uh, the Unfair and Deceptive act, mm -hmm. uh, Acts and Practices. And so if you look at it, you can argue there's a lack of focus and you can argue that there's a lack of enforcement, not so much on my members, because we have examiners in the, all, all the time, but on the non-banks. So what we have, our, our problem with the agency, we can get into it, but we're not, we're not saying there shouldn't be more focus on consumer issues and more ability to impact mm -hmm. uh, the non-banks uh, who, we can argue this too, but are primarily the, mm -hmm. the cause of the Amen. You know, it's, this, is a, this is an interesting dialogue, and I think it shows you know, the, the ways of Washington in certain respects. Um, Ed, Ed and, the, and the banks are all for uniformity right, uh, 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 here and, and making sure that the non-banks who are playing in the mortgage markets play by the same rules that they play by. Right. What's, but what's missing here is the fact that these are not separate worlds. Right. That, uh, as I said earlier, right, behind all these non, all these non-bank players uh, are bank and particularly large bank uh, financing and large bank pickup of the mortgages that, that the non-bank players uh, uh, sell, put out in the public, the, bit, the banks pick up and package, securitize and sell off, take the fees, uh, and the like. We have one system here. We've always had one system. And the problem is that we've asked regulators to regulate that system and asked them to do something that, that, that the regulators themselves, in truth, find to be contradictory. We've asked the regulators to be both the safety and soundness guardians of the banks. And safe, what safety and soundness means is, are the banks healthy? Are they doing, making mm -hmm. money? If you're a safety and soundness regulator, you like to, make, you like to see the banks making money. Yeah. Certainly the Fed liked to see the banks making money when they were doing it. Of course, you're supposed to th be thinking, well, yeah, but we don't want them to take lots of risks and to make money in ways that are unsustainable. But in real life with real people, it doesn't work that way. Right? Everything, looks, everything that's profitable looks reasonable at the time through the eyes of safety and soundness. Then we ask those same people, look out for the consumer. The, the truth is that when you ask an agency to do that, you know, they tell Junior to look after the consumer. 
You know what I mean? Junior is the guy who showed up yesterday. So should there be separate agencies <laughs> doing the consumer and exactly. the soundness? Right. This and is explain the, how you would do that. Right. This, is the, this is the proposal that uh, President Obama has put forward in the Treasury White Paper, uh, and President Obama has championed personally. This is the proposal that is in both the Barney Frank's version of financial reform on the House side and in Chris Dodd's version on the Senate side. And what it basically says is we are going to take the consumer protection function Consumer protection in all the, all those areas where where in order to be an ordinary person in America you've got to interact with the financial system. Mm -hmm. You got you got to have a credit really you got to have a credit card these days. If you you know middle class people pretty much have mortgages. Uh, you need to have a bank account. Um, you uh, you know those are th those are the kinds of things we're talking about regulating. We're not talking about you know exotic stuff. We're talking about the basics of modern American life. Those areas need to be regulated in a consolidated way by one agency with one mandate, which is to protect the consumer. Edward, is that right? Well, our problem is kind of the mirror image of that. Our problem is you can't separate the two. And I'll, because we tend to talk about big banks, I represent thousands of, of community banks. And so if you're a community bank, you look at this, and not every community bank is perfect on consumer stuff, but None of them made any subprime loans, or very few of them made any subprime loans. And you're sitting out there. Let me give you a profile of a community bank. Typical community, the median community bank has 34 employees. The median community bank today is subject to 1,700 pages, small print, consumer regulation, and consumer guidelines just in the consumer area. That's 50 pages for every employee you have in a bank. But why is that bank. a bad thing? Just because it's, it's too many pages? It's a lot. I know, but is that a bad thing? It's a bad thing. We're I mean, talking people always use, oh, there's a thousand pages, no, no, so no, therefore it's we're bad. Talking. So that for seems most like of a, them, it's more than uh, an pages. argument so you have to yeah, drill right. down on. Yeah. Okay. You're giving me the opportunity <laughs> to draw that on. The, the, what I'm saying is they are very, very heavily regulated in this area uh, today. And so for half of them, it's more than 50 pages. And that's just consumer. But what you're saying to them is you have an examiner that comes in and regulates you and looks at you almost every year, goes through all this, goes through all your consumer stuff. Now all of a sudden you're going to have another examiner. So those two examiners come. One of them comes in one week and they look at your, at your check hold policies. And they, the safety and soundness says, the Fed says, well, I have to balance what the consumers want, which is money right away on their checks with the fact that there's a lot of fraud in the system, billions of dollars, mm. so I need to protect you, with the fact that we have to figure out how to clear all this stuff so we, the Fed, wear our clearing hat. And so we balance all that. Now you're going to have a consumer examiner come in, this is the real world, and tell you something different. And on issue after issue after issue, you're going to have that conflict in the small bank. Damon, how do you deal with that conflict? Well, let's start out by saying that, in fact, the, the example that Ed's talking about, check clearing, is not one of the things covered uh, in the statute. No, 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 no. that is and, not true. And, and no, 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 no. Wait, no, wait, no, is no, it? Well, no, it's, no, it's check holds are ah, covered. By no, the no, see, you see. Okay, uh, let, 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 let's get off check holds for a second and tell but me. See, but, but now you understand the nature of the boogeyman argument. Right? The boogeyman argument is, is that some big complicated thing is going to come and settle on something simple. Uh, like, uh, something we all care about, like check clearing. And then it turns out it's actually check holds. No, I right? said check holds no, to no, start with, all right? right? All right. Now, secondly, we've do, we've, th this subject matter brings up the, the vast and sympathetic community banks. And there are lots of community banks, and they are, in many ways, very sympathetic folks. Right? But remember what I said a moment or two ago about consumer issues generally, which is that this is one system. If the credit cards completely dominated by the four or five largest banks. I think it's about 70% of the credit card business held by those banks. I talked, I talked earlier about, sub, about mortgages and the, and, the dom, and the dominance of the large banks as the providers of finance through the mortgage system. Now, if you, we can either have a real regulatory system that, that lets nobody out, or we can have a Swiss cheese system. We had a Swiss cheese system. Look what it got us. If we build a consumer protection system that doesn't include the small banks, Right, then the small banks will become the conduit, right? As as other people had become, as 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 non-bank financials became in the in the last bubble and the last uh, run up to the last crisis, small banks will become the conduit in the next one. Right now, it, but, but let uh, me get to his right. real point, which right. is you have conflicting regulators coming in and telling a bank 
two different things, why wouldn't it be one regulatory authority that tries to keep in mind both goals? If you have one regulatory authority, then you will get what you got, what we got before, right? which is no effective consumer protections. But why? Why, why couldn't a regulatory authority do it right instead of do it wrong? Uh, because of the structural conflict in what you are asking them to do. You don't ask people to do two tasks that bump into each other fundamentally. And it's very easy to resolve these conflicts in relation to consumer matters, which is that, and I think this is the, this is the structure involved, which is that if the Consumer Protection Agency says that a particular product is, a, is exploitive of consumers, end of story. Mm -hmm. right? And that is the way it ought to be. That is the way it is elsewhere in our economy. We do not let right, the FDA, the FDA does not let dangerous drugs out into the marketplace. Right? There's no conversation about the safety and soundness mm -hmm. of drug companies. We just don't let it happen. Right? We don't let toasters that explode into the marketplace. Right? We, we have a safety and soundness system. It's important. It's very important. Right? But it needs to be limited in that way so that, so, that it, mm -hmm. so that regulatory failure by the safety and soundness regulators, which we've just been through on a massive scale, right, uh, in relation to consumer protection is no longer a threat either to consumers or to our larger economy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that is, uh, we have been through this experiment now multiple times. This is not, by the way, the, 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 the only time in which these kinds of things, this kind of uh, process has L occurred. Let me switch because I want right. to get to other questions. Uh, derivatives, how should they be regulated? Now? Right, well derivatives, derivatives are a wonderful thing. Because with a derivative, a derivative is just a contract. It's a contract between two parties. It references something else, a stock, a bond, a commodity, something, the weather, uh, the, 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 uh, the score in the Yankees-Red Sox game. I mean, it, you can reference anything. A derivative is a contract between two parties that can reference anything. And so you know what a derivative really is? It's, it's not an economic category. It's a legal category. It's a fancy word for a loophole. It's a legal category to get you to do something which, if you did it the normal way, you'd, have, you'd be regulated. What kinds of things am I talking about? Insurance. AIG was in the derivatives business, they said. What they were really doing was selling insurance, insurance on bonds. All right? There's a huge derivatives market uh, around a, a variety of other kinds of risks that is nothing more than insurance. It's dominated by four or five large banks. It's, a, it's an opaque market, meaning that you don't know what the prices that are being quoted in that marketplace are. It's called over-the-counter. It's not on an exchange. And it's a market where we've had a problem with there not being enough capital to back the insurance. That was fundamentally what happened in AIG. AIG had regulated insurance subsidiaries that had capital. They were required to have it in order to sell insurance. They had disclosure requirements. Uh, and they had substantive fairness regulation of what they were doing. Then they had these other people in London who were doing the same thing. They were selling insurance, right? But they had no capital requirements, uh, no transparency. But so how would you regulate derivatives? Well, it's the answer is, I'm, I'm or, telling or you, capital, capital requirements. Okay. Right? Look, as far as I'm concerned, it's fine to sell an insurance policy. If you call it a derivative, I don't care. But you need to have capital, right? You need to have transparency uh, as to what the terms are, and you need to have fairness in dealing. That means, and you need to build it, you need to build the derivatives market so it can't be what it's been so far, which is a loophole. Meaning that if you're selling derivatives that are tied to public to securities, the SEC's got to have oversight. If you're selling derivatives that are tied to commodities, the CFTC has to have oversight. But what if you're like a normal company that wants to say, I need to hedge fuel prices, I'd like to do it through a derivative. I mean, there's some uses for these things, right? right? Well, yeah, no, there, if, if I want to hedge, if I want to, see, the, again, we got to break these terms down. I'm a normal company, like you say, I want to insure against the price of fuel moving against me, okay? If I want to do that, I'm in the position of the person paying a fee for an insurance policy. Now, all of us buy insurance policies. We buy insurance policies on our homes, right? When we buy insurance policies on our homes, are we required to post capital? Of course not. We just pay the premium. The pre if we stop paying the premium, then they cancel the policy on us. So if what I want to do is do that, I have a strong suspicion that the regulatory structure is not going to require that you post capital. But if what I'm really doing is I'm an operating business and I'm actually gambling, it's not just that I want to insure against the price moving. I want to buy that. I want to be fully exposed to that price moving. Meaning that I want to be, I want to make a lot of money if that price goes up, and I want to make, and I want to have, to, and I'm going to have to pay if it goes down. What I'm really doing is gambling, right? More or less. Then I got to post some capital, because otherwise, what happens if I can't pay? Right? What happens if I, what happens if, 
you know, I'm insuring, I'm quote, insuring against the price of fuel, and it happens to be, you know, the summer of 2008, uh, and the price of fuel quadruples, right? right? And, and I and a whole bunch of other people like me, who've all been dealing with one of the five banks that control the derivatives market, uh, by the way, the same, basically the same group of institutions that control the, uh, the credit card market and, and the same group of institutions uh, that are dominant in the, in the real funding of the mortgage markets, if we all default, uh, then we're back to TARP, yeah. right? And, unless we are allowed, unless there's capital requirements. So all main thing, I'm sorry, you're saying yeah. you put up a lot of capital, there should be capital requirements if you're going to... If, you're, if, 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 if you are taking risk, market. If, yeah. if you are taking risk, then you need to put up capital. Yeah. But, but let me just say that you've got to understand that this conversation is a conversation about, in public policy terms, about should derivatives be traded on exchanges, should they be cleared, yeah. and should they be regulated? Those are the three things you need to do if you want to have transparency, capital requirements, and fairness. What's your answer? Well, I'm going to take one second, sorry, to go back to the consumer with his closing oh, statement that, that it's end of the game, basically, if the consumer regulator says that. It's not that simple. Let's just take, there are many, many examples I could use. Let's again go back to uh, funds availability. The consumer agency says funds ought to be available immediately on that $5,000 out-of-state check. The safety and soundness regulator says, and the check clearing regulator says, well, we can't clear that that fast. If you do that, you're going to have massive fraud. Those to me are not, are something that needs to be worked out. It's not, this trumps all the time. It doesn't trump all the time. There, there are many ways that these are, are intersected. Um, on the derivatives, um, we clearly need more regulation of it. And I'm sure everybody knows here one of the great typical Washington deals here is one of our problems is we have two committees of jurisdiction and neither one of them will move so public policy is not governed by what may be right or wrong it's governed by the fact that based, based on pork bellies and things like that we ended up with two committees of jurisdiction which makes things much more complicated um, a lot of these need to be uh, have more capital behind them we ought to have more transparency they ought to be on exchanges and I think a lot of that's going to be done. I think, and you, you kind of gave the example, where the rub is, is if I'm a uh, airline company and I want to hedge my fuel costs, that that is a very, can be a very individualized contract. And to what degree can you do the individualized contracts in a way that's safe and sound instead of kind of forcing everything uh, off into the exchanges? Now, if you're, if you're doing it for speculative purposes, yeah, I don't think you can do it with the individual contracts, nor should you be able to. And there should be adequate capital behind them. I think this is its an area where I wouldn't pretend to have great <laughs> expertise, but I think it is an area where they're, pr they're pretty close to mm -hmm. They're arguing about the Let me ask one final point. question at 30,000 feet, if I may, and then turn it over, which is, and it picks up something Damon said at the very beginning, or maybe I'm misinterpreting what he said, but that... As a country, we had an economy for generations that was basically making goods and products, and to some extent services, and we've shifted more and more to being a company that's in financial instrument creation businesses, and our best and brightest up until a couple of years ago were leaving uh, PhDs in math from MIT to go into the financial products industry instead of creating new things. And we've just created a whole incentive structure to cause the creation of more complex derivatives, more complex financial issues that didn't help the economy but hurt it. This is, I, I think this is the most central question. It's great that we close on it. What kind of economy are we going to be and what role will financial markets and financial institutions play in that economy? The financial markets are not wealth creating enterprises. They are intermediaries. They are meant to transfer savings, all of us saving away hopefully, uh, into investment, uh, into productive activity, uh, which, is, which is then the wealth generating uh, uh, engine of our economy. The more efficient, uh, the, 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 frankly the cheaper the financial markets uh, and financial institutions are able to do this, the better. Uh, of course, in any kind of transfer, there's a risk that something get lo gets lost, or right? there's a risk of leakage and the like. We made the mistake, particularly in the last 10 years, 
uh, of thinking that we could found our economy on finance. And, and, we, and we were indulged in that mistake uh, by what Ed referred to at the beginning of his remarks, the uh, excess liquidity funded by our trade deficits that was floating around in the world. We, that whole little illusion came to a very unpleasant end. And we're very fortunate that it wasn't worse. Uh, in fact, we're not, it's not really clear how much, when I say that's kind of a why, I shouldn't have said that at all. The fact is, it's terrible. The, the, the fact is that we have 10% unemployment in this country as a result, is a direct result of this little escapade, uh, something we haven't seen for a generation. Many people are desperately hurting. We have millions of people who've been thrown out of their homes. We're not even to the halfway point on foreclosures. We have paid a terrible price as a country for this illusion. Uh, and, and the price is not going away in terms of the hollowing out of our manufacturing sector, in terms of the, the, the fundamental wrong turn we've taken. And the measures of what a fundamental wrong turn we've taken are ironically the measures of how good it felt during the moment of peak illusion. Right? The, me the measure of 40% of the profits of the S&P 500 during 2006 coming from the financial sector. Right? That should have been the signal that we were about to go off a cliff. Right? The fact <clears throat> that, at, that by some measures, 25% of our GDP at the peak of the bubble uh, was indirectly or indirectly coming from the financial sector. But these are, these are absurd facts, but they were true. We cannot return to that economy. If we do, it will be a brief, uh, you know, a, a brief return to the opium pipe, so to speak, uh, before, uh, you know, before very hard. Is that good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what moment in the cycle you pick. <laughs> uh, we cannot return to that moment. What we need is, uh, is re-regulation of the financial sector that is comprehensive, that does not indulge these fantasies of being able to say, oh, it's not the banks that did it, or it's not these people, it's not that, those people, that takes away the loopholes. And you've heard about a lot of, a lot of suggested loopholes this afternoon. It takes away all the loopholes right, and makes the financial sector be the servant of the real economy, not its master, the producer, uh, the, the facilitator of, the produ producing, of producing good jobs not the destroyer of good jobs and, and, and the hopes of people. Uh, not, not to make the financial sector go away, or not, mm -hmm. not to you know, put Ed out of work or anything like that. We wouldn't want that. Uh, but to make it do what it's supposed to do. Ed? I think, um, I think if you look at some of the numbers back in the period that Damon's talking about, they are indicative of the fact that uh, we had a financial sector that uh, was um, too big a part of the S&P, as he's saying, that uh, we were spending too many great people out of college were going, saying, I'll go to Wall Street and getting involved in derivatives rather than running big companies. I think there's a lot to that argument. And I think we, we need to get back to a financial sector that uh, is serving uh, its purpose, serving its community, serving people. Uh, we had a terrible disaster uh, that really hurt people. Um, I think it does, I think in terms of regulation, it does go somewhat to the Systemic Oversight Council. Um, and there's a great debate about whether you can really see bubbles or not see bubbles and really see problems. I think in some cases, in retrospect, uh, these bubbles were so obvious that it's not a matter of, oh, well, we can't quite know what the right S&P number is. If you look at some of the charts, I'm sure Damon's seen them, of what was going on with some of these types of mortgages where in a two-year period that chart goes like that, somebody somewhere should have been going, uh, that's going to blow up. I mean, you, all you had to do is look at that chart and see it's going to blow up. So I, I, I do think that the financial sector needs to be a smaller part of the economy. And please introduce yourself. Hey, Matt. <laughs> Anything? Uh, I'm Tom Donlin with Barron's Magazine. Okay. and. Uh, the, the door that you talked about before about uh, that lets in the loopholes, to mix that metaphor, was far more uh, firmly closed in 2006, let's say, than it is today. <clears throat> There's far more expectation that if some institution uh, gets in trouble that we will tarp them uh, back into solvency, yeah. far more. Why do you, th why do you persist? To, 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 load, to load the question, why do you persist in assuming that regulation can actually solve the problem? It never solved it before, even when it was more credible than it is today. 
Let me let, let me speak to that because I think I I, I want to cover a little bit the narrative that your question presumes. Right? We had a system from the New Deal until uh, March of 2008 that was very simple. If a bank failed, it was put into a resolution process by the FDIC. Its stockholders were wiped out. So it was not a good thing for a stockholder bank to have the bank fail. And its bondholders, the long-term creditors, uh, were impaired to the, to, the, to the extent necessary to ensure that the depositors were paid. If a stock brokerage, a stock brokerage, by the way, is what they used to call investment banks before they got better tailors. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a stock brokerage failed. It failed. That you all, there was some protection for the account holders. If you had stocks in the, at the brokerage, there was some protection for the account holders. Everybody else was just in the bankruptcy court. You just went to bankruptcy court like, like what would happen if an auto parts supplier failed, and that was the end of the story. And every time that such an institution did fail, there would be people, often who worked for that institution, uh, would call up the Treasury or the Fed and say, help, help, we're failing. Uh, this happened uh, most, most prominently uh, with Drexel Burnham. Right? Uh, Drexel Burnham, an earlier version of all this. Uh, when Drexel Burnham failed, they wanted to be rescued by the government. And the government said no. The, the first Bush administration said, no, you're a stock brokerage. Go to the bankruptcy court. Now, that was the regime. And in terms of what you were talking about, about penalizing folks and getting the and, and that sort of thing, that regime worked fairly well. Uh, and it protected uh, depositors. So we had a system where there was discipline and yet confidence at the same time. As I said, that system ended in March of 2008 when we bailed out Bear Stearns. And, they, and at that moment, a regulatory conceptual black hole opened up. Uh, and that black hole was, here's Bear Stearns, an uninsured institution, not regulated as if we're going to bail it out, and we bailed it out. Now, why did we do that? Because I, I talked to the people who made the decision, and they say they did it, full, full well knowing what I just said and agreeing with what I just said because they said the consequences were going to be worse because they had no idea what would happen if Bear Stearns failed because of Bear Stearns' intertwined uh, uh, relationship with the shadow, with the shadow markets, uh, particularly with the derivatives markets and with hedge funds as a prime broker for hedge funds and a variety of other things. They, if they let Bear Stearns go, they said they didn't know what would happen next. Now, you may say, well, these people were just cowards. They didn't have the strength of character that uh, the first President Bush and Nicholas Brady and those folks had, and they were just cowards, and they bought the, the line that Bear Stearns fed them. I'm not sure about that. I think that these were smart people who were trying to do their best, and they looked at the world as they saw it. I, I think Hank Paulson became a devotee of regulating hedge funds the next day. Uh, and, uh, and then we went from there to Lehman Brothers. And in Lehman Brothers, I'm convinced, no one will admit this now, but I'm convinced that for the very reasons I was just outlining, the view was somebody had to take, take the fall. That if we're going to have a co we were going to have a coherent financial regulatory system, somebody had to fail. I think that's the implication of your question. And Lehman was, Lehman was it. Lehman fit the old model of who we let fail. Now, of course, what happened after that was such that nobody will admit that that's what they did. I think that's what they did, and I honor them for it. And, but then... We went, into, we went really off the deep end, and we started doing, the, we, we, the United States government, through TARP, uh, rescued the stockholders right, uh, of, st of First Citigroup and then Bank of America when those institutions were failing. And, 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 and that, is, that just, I think, unraveled uh, the system that worked and put us into, into a system that we now have to fix. And your question is, how can we fix it? All right, the, the, how can we get back to a world in which, in which there's, a ra there's a reasonable That's expectation? Really that's, oh, I'm sorry. No. Um, my question is that the, under the system of regulation, right. a city group became the city group we know and despise today. Oh. Under the si system of regulation, Bear Stearns became the, the uh, hedge fund operator of, uh, of ill repute, and so on, and so on, and so on. All the, all the cracks that were exposed in 2008 were built were opened and, and built and papered over by a system of regulation, so and, how do you which you now propose, well, then, which you now are proposed to, uh, well, see, to improve. It, dep it depends. It de see, everyone looks at this. People look at this differently depending on where they're coming from in different ways. I would say this. We had a system of regulation. It worked well. We started dismantling it. As we dismantled it, we created the kinds of institutions you were just talking about. If you, look at, if you look at the trend line, 
in terms of regulatory coverage and regulatory strength. It is, during, it is when those systems are weakened and, uh, and made incoherent and Swiss cheese-like that you get what we got. I think it is a fair question, and I suppose it just represents my optimism in life, right, to say, well, given the intertwined nature of f financial institutions and political power, is it going to be possible to build a regulatory system that recaptures the kind of integrity and strength that we had in the post-New Deal era today? Like I said, I'm an optimist. I think it's possible to do. If you think it's not possible to do, then then either you're essentially taking the position of, you know, you're just giving up on the political process, or you believe that we, that, and, you know, people do give up on the political process and go live in woods and stuff like that. Or you believe, <laughs> or you believe that we should return to the pre-New Deal environment in which we had bank runs, meaning that we go back to a system of, compl of complete deregulation of the financial sector. Uh, where, you know, you, you put your money in the bank and you take your chances as to whether the bank is there tomorrow. There are people who believe that that is the right thing to do. Uh, I'm a student of history. I, I do not. That's right here, sir. Can I just comment briefly? Yeah, okay. Uh, the gentleman here. Yeah, yeah. Then. Uh, you know, My I name's think, Robert Wager. And wait, wait, wait. I'll Robert, just, would you uh, let Ed make a quick I think, comment? I think, you, I think if I understand maybe an import of your question, the, we ought to try, and I think we will, have a better regulatory system and have some of these issues dealt with. But what you may be saying is it's likely to crack again at some point in the future. I, I, was, I was actually, I'm, I'm, the good thing is I'm, old, I'm so old and been so involved, I have a lot of history in this. The bad thing is I can't remember most of it. <laughs> but I can remember very generally, I was very involved in what is called the systemic risk exception which is what was used by, it's the FDIC's exception. And it's what was used wrongly, they made it up, to, to guarantee all these bonds of these companies. I fought personally like crazy to end too big to fail. I was defeated by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve said to Congress, you cannot get, get rid of too big to fail. We need an out because we don't know what we will do with a city bank in the year 2008. This was 25 years ago. You got what's called the systemic risk exception. You can read it. It's a couple of paragraphs. And the problem was that was so general. Nobody knew what it meant, but people did really think that they would not let some of these institutions go down. They didn't know where the line is. What we really need to have is a credible, that's why this, I think the most important part of this is systemic resolution. You have to have a credible system that says, next Bear Stearns, if you're a stockholder, you're gone. But it has to have credibility. We didn't have that. Nobody knew what the rules were. So I think in addition to doing the best job we can of improving regulation, you need to have us credible. I don't think it'll be perfect. But the stockholders of Bear Stearns, which was turned into a hedge fund, need to understand if it goes down, we're going to be wiped out. And yes, they didn't Robert. understand yeah. it. Uh, my name is Robert Wager, and I'm with Prudential Financial. But 30-odd years ago, I was one of the drafters of the Consumer Product Safety uh, Commission. Uh, and uh, listening to uh, Mr. Yingling, it was like uh, listening to Norris Cotton on the Senate floor making all the arguments against it. Uh, now, the CPSC has had its ups and downs o over the years, but I think overall it's improved uh, uh, product safety. It's worked out conflicts with other agencies, and I think uh, that since there is such a glaring lack of consumer uh, protection in certain areas that the CFPA uh, is addressed to, with the precedent of the CPSC, I think we ought to let it go forward. Well, I'll just because this is the example that's used all the time that we regulate toasters and and we don't we don't allow toasters to blow up. So let's do the same thing with consumer products. It's a good argument, but here's what the CFPA does, and it's another one of our problems. The CFPA, as proposed by the administration, is the most powerful agency ever proposed. It can do anything it wants. It doesn't just regulate a toaster. It doesn't say if you have a toaster and it has this bad wiring, we're going to send it back and make you readjust how it does. It is explicitly authorized to say, we're going to design a toaster. We're going to make you offer that toaster. We're going to make you put that toaster in the window with the government toaster. 
We're going to make you put your toasters that you design that may be better for your local customers in the back, and you're going to put a warning on that toaster that says, this one's not government approved, it's not as good as that toaster. That's what was proposed. Now, Barney Frank has taken out part of that. It's still in the Dodd bill. So I think there is a good argument about we ought to have a system that says you can't use that toaster. The question is who does it? And be able to say either that toaster's outlawed or send that toaster back. But what was proposed is so much more powerful. And, and by the way, this agency can also regulate, explicitly regulate, how your salespeople are compensated when they sell that toaster. And the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission can't do any of that stuff. You, you know, these, Real quick, because we've got a lot of These things. are precisely the reasons why every consumer in this country ought to be for it, right? <laughs> and, the re and the reason why you, we you want the government for designing your products well, for you. Well, yeah. if the government can design a product that consumers like better than the ones your folks are designing, I don't see a problem with that. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and that's all we're talking about in relation to the idea that there should be plain vanilla products. And by the way, with children's pajamas. And by the way, we do this all the time. For if anyone is familiar with insurance regulation, we effectively already do this in financial services. We do it at the state level in insurance regulation. If you don't think so, see what happens when you go to buy auto insurance. Right? They don't give you tw a menu of 20 things, none of which you can understand. They give you they give you a list, and it starts with the minimum mandated product by the, by the state authority. Just, now, now, why, now, why we have allowed our economy to be destroyed, right? To be pushed to the brink of destruction, right? By an, uh, by unregulated consumer financial products. Unregulated? Right. There's 1,700 well, pages yeah, of regulation. No. Well, we, you talked earlier. You talked about the weakness of the Fed in regulating mortgages. Yeah. The reality was the mortgage market was unregulated. Mm -hmm. All those pages may have been there, but it was unregulated. And we allowed that to bring our economy and the world economy to the brink of destruction. And now we're going to say, oh, too many pages of regulation, too powerful regulators and the like. It just strikes me as it's just completely implausible. If we're, if we're right, dumb have, to I have a that, quick response, but I do <laughs> want to get back to the audience. I just say about the plain vanilla products, it was such a great idea that, that, that the great tool of the banking industry, Barney Frank, th threw it out within two weeks of after it was proposed. Because well, that, that is simply a measure of certain people's political power versus the rest of us. Well, not on Barney. We don't have to say that Barney. I mean, let's not insult Barney there. Uh, it's not an insult. Barney has to get the votes. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's, I, I, I'm no, no, he threw it out because he thought it was a bad idea. All right. Uh, we have a blogger question yeah, and a question I'm, back there. I'm going to channel a blogger I'm, I'm question for both of you. Uh, let, uh, we're not going to impugn the motives <laughs> of what people did. This question comes from Mike uh, Consackle. He's a blogger at the Atlantic Business Chancel, a, a Channel and the Rorty Bomb. And the question is for both of the discussants, but since we're on toasters, <laughs> I think we'll have Mr. Yingling tackle it first. So he asks, in 2006, a series of laws were passed to protect members of the military and their families from usurious interest rates and the sale of predatory insurance and security products. So to what extent should similar laws be enacted for all Americans? And are there other approaches to consumer financial protection that you find convincing? Actually, um, the, the fact is, and you got, I'm going to go back to the example I used earlier of the credit card uh, situation. There is, there is a general statute. And in fact, it was not generally used in the banking area. It's unfair and deceptive acts and practices. It was only, it's the FTI, FTC's general rule. It was only used in the banking area on a case-by-case -case basis, I think with one minor exception. And the Fed has now used it in the credit card area. And if you look at what it did in the credit card area, you may not agree with it, whether it went too far or not quite far enough. The Congress trumped it. But if you look at the issues it dealt with in terms of categories, all the way to basically outlawing certain practices, regulating certain things, the Fed and actually the OTS are the only two that have this authority to use that in a regulatory way. The FDIC and the OCC can only use it case by case. What we have said is all the agencies, they ought to do it in a coordinated fashion, or if there is some kind of new agency or coordinating body, it can use that authority to basically regulate any consumer product in a very robust fashion. And so I think a lot of people don't realize what the uniqueness and the, and the precedent-setting 
uh, that took place when they when the Fed came out with that credit card rule because they did it under this broad UDAP authority. Having established that precedent, it means again we ought to spread it to all the agencies or to this new agency. They basically can regulate uh, all consumer products and and the delivery of consumer products in a very robust fashion. Now, yes, a, a lot, I just had a lot of this depends on who you have. Now we we talk about the names of agencies and stuff. I think Sheila Bear is known as a very pro-consumer uh, regulator, and a lot of this depends on who you have in these agencies. They do Walter, have the power to do these things. Walter, can I just ask, because because the, I think the point of the blogger's question was uh, our response to the notion that there ought to be clear authority, uh, to, as there is in the military bill, to regulate usury. Right? Now, I'm all right with that. Are you all right with that? No. No. <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> no. Now, I think, I think that answered the blogger's question. I'd like to keep us, I uh, actually have like six questions, but I'm just going to ask one and keep us here on the area of uh, consumer protection. And I guess what I'm trying to ferret out, um, and so I'm going to pose the question first to Mr. Yangling, and then I'd love to hear uh, Damon, your comments too. Um, but it seems to me that there's sort of two buckets of regulation when you talk about consumer protection. There's product regulation and then there's process regulation. And so we have all of these products, many of, of which have existed for a very, very long time. If you think about payment option arms or interest only loans and all their myriad variations. Um, but they were products that were used for a very, very niche market. They were used for a specific purpose. And they were products that those consumers wanted because they felt that uh, those were the best financial products for them, let's say in the case of an interest-only loan. Mm -hmm. The problem uh, that I see is that those products began to be used and pushed very heavily on consumers for whom they were not best suited right. and uh, pushed on consumers who didn't understand those products. So if I, if I understand your comments correctly, you're not that crazy about product regulation, and it seems to me that if you're not that crazy about product regulation, then the only alternative is process regulation. Um, but the industry has very uh, vehemently fought against suitability standards. Um, and so I guess I'm trying to figure out then, is there some other type of regulation bucket or category that you see that would afford us the kind of consumer protections that we need? Or how do you strike the balance between product regulation? That is such a good question. I'd love you to sort of say your name and who you work to. So. Lisa Rice with the National Fair Housing Alliance. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that you ought to be able to regulate products. Uh, I think the, the problem is, getting back a little bit into, assume that the government designs a product or government says this is the, this is the type of mortgage or the two or three types of mortgages. The problem with that can be that every day in this country you have bankers sitting around going, well, if I adjust this kind of product, it'll be good for the people, some people in my market. It might be good for senior citizens. It might be good for the college students. I'm uh, in certain states in the South. A lot of times you have a balloon payment, and that's the way it's done. So you need to leave the flexibility for them to design those products. But as we all know, then what happens is some of those designs can be used and, and morph into no doc, no down payment, terrible loans. I think whoever is regulating should be able to come in and say, we're going to put parameters around those. If we see this terrible loan, in certain cases say, you can't offer that kind of loan. It's just prohibited. Or is it a okay. smell test? Or, I mean, I don't see how you just say, come in and look at it. Well, that's what, I mean, that's what yeah. regulators have to do. They have to look at the, at the very, and, and if you look at the credit card uh, area, what the Fed literally did is they said, and, and they went through their Fed, Federal Reserve in economic analysis, and they said in certain things that credit cards do, we understand the economic argument, and we understand that if we do this, it may mean that some people don't get credit cards, or it may mean that they're a higher interest rate. But we, Ben Bernanke and the Fed, have determined that, that that idea is so difficult for consumers to understand and is so subject to abuse, we're just plain not going to let you do it. Double, double cycle billing. So they look at double cycle billing and say, you can't do it. We understand all the, the arguments for it. We understand that, you know, it's disclosed. The consumers don't understand it. You can't do it. 
and I think they should have that authority. They should. And they I want to understand it. you fully. Do you balance that with a, a suitability test then? I, the, the problem with the suitability test is you are taking something that is from the securities law and has a whole body of law around it, and you're applying it in a different situation. I, we don't have time to go through it. There's something like that, but the term suitability is a legal term that we have real problems with applying it to somebody who is making a loan to somebody. If I'm your investment advisor, I have a certain relationship with you. If I'm somebody you are coming to talk to to price a loan and you're going to go next door and next door and next door, I don't quite have that same relationship yeah. with you. Now, in the case of mortgage brokers, they're, you know, who do they represent? The question is, who does that person represent and does the person, the borrower, understand their relationship? So there have been abuses in the mortgage broker system. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think you're now hearing See, the, there's a thread to this conversation, and you're now hearing um, that the, the banking industry does not want to uh, have a, regi a, a set of rules uh, other than essentially let the buyer beware. Now, we have let That's the buyer beware. I'm sorry, of that is not at all. Well, wait, Damon, said. Damon, that is overstepping it. He's talked about a whole lot of rules. No, but what I'm talking about is the, the, the questioner asked. Yeah. What type of relationship do you want to have between the person applying for the mortgage or the credit card yeah. right, and the, and the institution selling it? And Ed said, I'm not comfortable with a set of rules that, that, that imposes duties to the customer. I didn't right? say that either. I said well, suitability. Well, that, well, Wait, you, suitability you is a legal term, and he said he wouldn't term. apply that. Suitability is a legal term used in the securities industry, industry as Ed said, right, for people who sell financial instruments to other people. Now, if no, it's for people who represent that person. Right, and you and and you're not comfortable with imposing that standard, and you've but you've not offered a different standard that would impose any kind of obligation to the customer not to not to take advantage of them. And what would and, you but, what no, would you but, offer? But, but, uh, oh, hold on, that no, no, statement no. is categorically no. false. But now hold on. We, we no, don't, we don't. You, you constantly are attributing things to me. Yeah, Damon, why don't you make your argument right. instead of attributing things to Ed? No, we don't. Ask of a lot of people in our society. If you walk in to buy, if you walk in to buy a hamburger, the person selling you the hamburger doesn't have any duty to you other than to sell you a hamburger and to comply with the food safety laws. We regulate pretty intensively, Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, as the as, as the thing you're selling gets more complicated and more dangerous, and as the institution that's selling it to you gets more powerful compared to the consumer, and we have a marketplace in financial services that is selling very complicated products dominated by a handful of mega banks. Right? It is the classic situation where you, want to, where you either want to have very heavy duty regulation of both product and process, or you want to impose some duties like the suitability rule. And it may be that, it may be that I've read more into your statement than, than you said, but if I have, what I'd like you to say is, what is the obligation you think, the legal obligation that a person selling a mortgage to a homeowner ought to have when they are doing so? They have an obligation not to mislead them. They have an obligation to give them full and fair disclosure. They have an obligation to comply with all the laws. I don't think they have an obligation to, in a legal standard, say, because they don't have that relationship with the customer, say, I am guaranteeing you, which is kind of what a suitability standard is, that this is the best loan for you. Because that's not the relationship. This is a lending officer that represents the bank. They need to have fair dealing. The customer doesn't expect that from that person. They may expect it from a mortgage broker, which is why the mortgage broker situation was different. But in terms of a customer dealing with a lending officer, they're going to go next door and next door and next door. They, should, they know that that person doesn't represent them, but that person has an obligation for full disclosure, fair dealing, not having uh, bombs in there, not telling them that, oh, don't worry about this because uh, you'll be able to refinance two years from now. Right. And, well, and, is there, and is there any circumstance in the, in the arrangement you just described, is there any circumstance in which it would be proper to sell someone a 2 and 28 mortgage? The 2 and 28 mortgage is one where the interest rate jacks up after two years. Um, there are very, very limited uses for that, and it would be, for example, somebody is about to graduate from Harvard Law School and is going to go to work and get a job in, in, a, in a firm and make $150,000 a year, and they want to buy a house. 
And that's kind of how those things but started, our, but then they morphed into but, but isn't that But isn't that why you ought to have a suitability standard then? No, I just explained to you. No, but, but, but you're saying there's a very, very limited set of uses and for a two and 28 mortgage. How, what, what is going to stop under the legal system you just described, what is going to stop the person who is being incentivized yeah. to sell those mortgages from yeah. selling them to anyone under the sun? Well, you, you, just, you would have to disclose to them clearly what happens after two years. It may be it may be that you make the decision as they did with double cycle billing that the thing sign is just here, too risky. Sign here, sign here. Here's your two and twenty eight mortgage. It's it is it is like it is like dominoes falling from that proposition but to ten percent unemployment if, if, and tarp. If you say you, 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 want, you, you go Damon, let him answer boom, if you would, please. If you say to if you say to me, the lending officer, that if I that if I if I am making a loan to somebody, I have to determine in advance that that person, that the loan I am making is suitable to them. That is a completely different relationship. That is the proper relationship between a Merrill Lynch broker and that person. But it is not the proper relationship between a lending officer who is selling a product to somebody to basically say, when you say a suitability standard, I am guaranteeing that that is the proper loan to you, for you. That is not. But Ed, let really me good. ask you then, since it didn't work and right. people were given and sold and driven to sign mortgages that were clearly irresponsible, right. what would you do to stop that now? Well, I think in some cases, the loans just need to be outlawed. And from a, from a you know, one of the amazing things when you look back on it is how on earth loans that were no doc loans, no down payment loans, that had resets that were sold to people that clearly could not afford. There was nothing in their documentation that said they could afford how these were made. And in some cases, you just have to outlaw it. In and you outlaw cases, it with a new agency? No, they can outlaw it today. They could, okay. The Fed actually could have outlawed most of this. But wouldn't you need a new book. protection agency or somebody to keep up with all the evolving new things that could be thrust upon a consumer? Not necessarily. I think you need, you need a, a methodology, whether it be inserted in a current agency or whether or not you have some group that is that is set up to do it with a special focus that just really does have more focus on it. I think there is a very legitimate argument that that going back over the years the agencies did not have sufficient focus on consumer protection. And I in a in a recent speech to our own group, I said to our own group, one of the problems that we at the ABA had is we focused too narrowly on our members that we needed to focus, one, on those, the mortgage brokers and others who were making these loans, and we should have been more aggressive in talking about the need to regulation, understanding, doing our own systemic risk, the, the problems that were building up in the mortgage market. And frankly, we have some people in our own industry, and we should be more aggressive in saying, uh, you, we just can't do those things, because what happens a, is they blow us up. There's a lot more to be said. We've hit the witching hour. Why don't we all make this an informal conversation, because I know some people would love to come up and ask private questions. But I really want to thank, thank both you, of you. Boy, you. this is enlightening for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. I was totally enlightened, but I didn't know. Let's I came go. in here innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, I'm uh, yeah, yeah, with uh, Andrew Leaders.